love music documentaries uh, in particular. Kind of my favorite style of documentary. It's a, that's a genre unto itself is a really good music doc. So let's talk about your doc, uh, Frank Meyer. Hey, Risen. Chris. Risen. It's the, the story of Sharon Hellraiser Smith. It is out now on VOD, all platforms. You can get it everywhere. Frank Meyer, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. Why, thank you, Chris. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. I actually, uh, as you know, am a <laughs> yes. big Film Threat fan. Well, thank you. I used to read it back in the day in college. And when I met you back in the G4 days, uh, people were like, oh, we got this new guy. He's going to come on and attack the show and review DVDs. His name is Chris Gordon. I'm like, oh, I'm familiar with the oh, work of Chris Gordon. Come on, stop it, it was, Frank. Uh, so stop. It was, I, I'm stoked to be here and, and stoked that you are still championing film. Well, you know, uh, I don't know how I'm doing it because it certainly doesn't pay well. Probably pays about as well as making a documentary. Right, exactly. Which you would it's know a, something about. It's a labor of love. But you've been working on this doc for, I want to say, like, I don't know, because especially if you go by the footage. I mean, you got footage from, um, God, you know, long time, the funny, decade ago. Yeah, well, actually, it goes farther back than that. When I first met uh, the rapper known as Hellraiser, um, he was in, in his real life uh, known as Sean Smith. Mm -hmm. um, he was a rapper in a group called Sons of Man. Mm -hmm. And I was a publicist when early in my career, when I first got into show business, I was a little rock and roll guitar player and going to college and having to work as a junior publicist and then a mm -hmm. actual publicist in show business. And yeah. I got this gig working on the Sons of Man record, and I was a huge Wu-Tang fan. This was about 1997. And I took this job at this label because I wanted to work the Sons of Man record, and I became friends with Reza. So if you go by when did I first put a camera on Reza, it would be in 1997 during the recording sessions of Sons of Man's first record. They were making a remake of Earth, Wind & Fire's Shining Star with, yeah. old, with Old Dirty Bastard, <laughs> produced by Wyclef, and Proz from the Fugees was there. All of Earth, Wind & Fire was there, all of Sons of Man, and I went to the studio to film the EPK. And so there's some footage in the movie of that recording session. So if you go by that, we've been making the movie since 1997. However, I didn't realize any of that footage was getting used at the time I was just shooting it for, right. for you know, my job. Years later, when we were all at G4... Uh, I was doing a podcast called Freestyle 101 where we would interview rappers kind mm -hmm. of about the art of rapping. And because I had this relationship with Reza uh, and a couple other guys from the group, Killer Priest and Prodigal Son, I had them all come on the show at different times. This is when they were solo and perform on the show. And that was another time I, I filmed Reza, but not knowing where it was going to go. A few years after that, I got word that he'd had this brain aneurysm. I just read about yeah. it on like allhiphop.com or something. And I called him up, and he didn't sound good, but he was downplaying it a little bit. Kind of mm. like, oh, man, it's going to be fine. I'm going to be rapping again soon, blah, blah, blah. And a mutual friend of ours, Joe Lynch, and I went out to uh, go shoot some stuff in New York for Freestyle 101. And we decided just to take a little trip out to visit Reza. And that was when I first saw him in person. He was in a wheelchair. He was not doing well. He was super depressed. And what he really hadn't revealed to people is that he, he didn't just have an aneurysm. He, didn't, he wasn't just slurring a little bit. He lost the entire left side to his body. So yeah. he couldn't walk. He, couldn't, uh, he really couldn't do much of anything the way that he, he had. And he certainly couldn't rap the way that he, he had. He was a fiery, fast, lyrical rapper. And now it was hard for him to even talk it with a, a normal cadence. He was struggling. And since we were out there shooting rappers, when, when we met Reza, we kind of thought it was really heavy. It was like, wow, here's a guy who had all these skills mm -hmm. and now had them taken away. And we thought that was just a really interesting position to be in. So I asked Reza if we could start filming some of his his recovery. And he was very guarded at first. But eventually, because we had this history together, he was like, all right, man, we'll just, you know, just make sure you got my back. And so we started filming it. Well, it's interesting because it's kind of like uh, the recovery of two things. One, the recovery of his 
you know, physical well-being, right? And his road to recovery, you know, you've documented that. In addition, it's kind of the road to recovery of his career. Because there's an interesting thing where he talks about how, like, you know, he couldn't maybe get a full sentence out of this thing, but he could get a piece of it. And it's like, but that's how people do it anyways when they record. They'll get a piece of something, repeat it and whatnot. But but to back up a bit, uh, before we talk about that, like, hip-hop is, in terms of a musical movement, is probably the biggest thing to happen in music. I don't know. I mean, it's I mean, since rock and roll, sure, right? I sure. mean, it's the only thing compared to is like biggest movements in music. That's rock and roll, hip hop, yeah. and and Wu Tang Clan. I feel like Wu Tang Clan is like Wu Tang Clan is kind of like trying to explain to someone who's never heard of the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the Marvel Comic Book Universe, like because it's there's so many people connected to Wu Tang Clan. Yeah, it's a, and that's a really good analogy too because they. <laughs> Not only were a group, and obviously hip hop and rock and roll had seen many groups, but it was mm -hmm. a nine person group. And every guy in the group had this very distinct identity and kind of a crazy sounding name, you know, Master Killer and right. the Genius and, you know, like Ghostface Killer, who for the first two years that Wu-Tang was a group, Ghostface didn't show his face. I don't know if you remember that, but he would wear a, <laughs> he would wear like a hood over his face and he was like the unknown MC, like the unknown comic. Like he would do these crazy raps and no one knew what he looked like and it wasn't until his first record Iron Man when he revealed himself like a comic book character mm -hmm. so all these guys really did have these larger than life personas and these rap skills that kind of matched it and so Wu-Tang when they came along really were like a comic book group you know and they and then very quickly they kind of embraced that there was Wu-Tang comics and Wu-Tang action figures and <laughs> you know even their logo had that kind of Batman sort of vibe like you could see it in the right. broadcast in the sky and be like I mean, my god Wu-Tang Clan assemble <laughs> it is like it, I mean it is like the Avengers right because yeah. they're I mean but the Avengers of you know uh, uh Endgame like the very end where it's just like everybody that sort of I I feel like almost like uh, I mean, Sharon was a part of that, right? Like he, the the way that Wu Tang operated at that time, and I think it's changed a lot. But RZA from Wu Tang was really the uh, sort of the master of the whole thing. You know, he mm -hmm. he put it together. He's the guy that had the idea of bringing in the the sort of the, the kung fu flicks and the samples from old movies, and you know, at the he had a a a, a sampler that that didn't quite work and so a lot of times the beats would have these little pops and like would be a little off kilter which actually became part of their sound oh, but it was because he just cool. had shitty equipment and <laughs> you know what i mean and but that's that's part of the lore of why they had such a unique sound why like their beats would suddenly shift and like didn't even sometimes seem like they were on a grid or anything because they weren't you yeah. know what i mean like this they were so so grungy about everything they did so rizza had all these ideas and what he did is he was working with his guys doing the Wu-Tang mm -hmm. Clan. At the same time, they, they were working in this studio called Firehouse. And all the guys, and they talk, we talk about some of this in the film, all the guys from Wu-Tang were in the studio making that. But then they would all tell their homies, like, hey, man, you got to come here. We're doing this cool stuff, and it's got horror movies and this, that, and this, and, you know, kung fu movie samples. And so all these other kids were coming around, and that was, like, the guys from, like, Grave Diggers and Killer Army and Sons of Man. And they were, like, a couple years younger, and it was, like, the nephew of this guy and the little brother of this guy. And mm -hmm. they were also in the studio writing and grinding and just hoping to get their shot because what would happen is they'd all be in there listening to a beat writing. And Rizzo would just come out and pick a, pick a dude. He'd be like, you, come in, give me one. And you might go in and lay down a verse that might never make it on a record or he might use on a different record. A lot of times he liked having people around because when he wanted to do skits, he could just call all the kids in the room and be like, all right, everyone act like you're in a gang fight. So all, like, all those Sons of Man guys are all over the first Wu-Tang record because they'd be like, I'm the voice you hear when this happens or I'm in the Bring the Ruckus chorus or this, that, and this. So at the same time, he made the Wu-Tang record. He made, uh, they, they were working on the Sons of Man early stuff and the Grave Diggers record, which Prince Paul from De La Soul was involved in. All that stuff was happening simultaneously, which when you think about it, is insane. The, the amount of music all coming from a bunch of guys who weren't even really by, by the music industry considered musicians. 
You know what I mean? Like this is before anyone took rappers seriously as musicians. So like, I'm sure even the engineers of the studio were just like, what the hell are these guys? <laughs> Kung Fu movies? And is he using a B, a sample of a B instead of a snare drum? But like what is it, happening here? But isn't that the best sort of creative environment is one where there's just like no, I mean, where the musicians- no rules. Are, There's no rules. You're just like, I mean, it's like a garage band or whatever. It's, it's just, punk rock. It's know? Yeah, it's a, sort of a punk rock approach. It's like, well- this is the equipment I have. I guess we'll just do it with this and, 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 and go from there. And you know? what happened is that that first Wu-Tang record blew up so huge that every member of the group, and this was kind of by design, got mm -hmm. a solo deal. And then RZA basically did a, had a production company and had an indie label, mm -hmm. and he was putting out like all the indie, indie groups, like the smaller groups, while his gang, all Method Man, right. and those guys were signing to major labels. He right. was doing like razor sharp records and putting out all this indie stuff that was more street, a little less commercial. That's where Sons of Man came out of. But then when the record, when the Wu-Tang record blew up, as did like mm -hmm. all the solo records, suddenly even the groups on the indie labels got major label deals. Yeah. So that's where I came in as I was working at this label called Red Ant. And I heard, oh, we're going to sign uh, Sons of Man. I'm like, you got to let me work that record. Like, that's my jam. I want to work with those guys. So that's kind of where our whole thing formed. But Reza was an interesting story because he was a kid. He was like a 14-year-old kid. All these other dudes were like in their early 20s. And he, him and a rapper named Shaheem, who was the rugged child, they were like the two little kids hanging out. But they were super dope rappers. And so everyone kind of knew like, oh, Reza's he's crazy. And he's super intellectual. And he was like, like a young Nas, like really deep spiritually. And he took that name Hellraiser I remember the Hellraiser movies. Yeah, yeah. But another sort of interesting thing with his story is that when he went through the tragedy of the aneurysm, among the things he started questioning was like, you know, have I sealed my own fate, naming myself Hellraiser? Mm. And he changed his spirituality and he started looking at things differently and at one point changed his name to Heaven Razor because mm. he had convinced himself that he had like sealed his own fate or by by like, taking this sort of anti-spirituality, horror movie, dark lyrics and stuff. And, you know, I think he, as time's gone on, he's gotten more perspective on that. And now it's kind of like, yeah, this is my body of work. Some of it's darker, some of it's lighter. But uh, he's gone through a, a lot of journeys from spiritual to rapping. And, and, and that's really what the movie is about. Because hip-hop, as you were saying, it's so... It's so based in bravado mm -hmm. and kind of being like a superhero, you know, like like a 50 cent will tell you that he got shot nine times. But he's telling you that in the context of like and then I survived and look how badass and successful I am. <laughs> he's not telling you about having to like piss in a bag or like maybe not be able to shower on his own or like the really humiliating or or really like kind of checking your ego by the door side of like recovering from you know, a gunshot wound or disease. So with Reza, we had this interesting opportunity to talk to a guy whose whole persona is based on not showing you that vulnerability. And now all he has is is the vulnerability and the truth, you know, and that and now he's leaning into that. You know? I mean, I mean, that's why it's such a it's such an incredible story is just seeing and you coming at it just because you I mean, you downplay your music career, <laughs> but you but I mean, you really coming at it from knowing this stuff on the inside. Sure, sure. Like, and uh, I would be remiss in my duties as an interviewer. Of it. Your brother, mm -hmm. you have a famous brother. I do. Do you mind, like, talking about yeah, it just sure, for a sure, minute? Sure. Like, I, I mean, uh, he, he he's appeared in, in a bunch of stuff that I've liked. Uh, my brother's Brecken Meyer, the actor who, uh, I mean, probably his most famous role is uh, Travis Birkenstock from Clueless. <laughs> right. Because uh, that's kind of an iconic role. It's funny. Yeah, it's, yeah. At one point, Brecken and I were talking uh, I think they did like a reunion at, at a Comic Con or something of the cast of that movie, uh -huh. and they were all on a panel. And he sent me a photo from it, and I said, you know, it. Think if you think about it, because we grew up in the '80s, and like our stoner icon was Jeff Spicoli, <laughs> right, you know, Sean right. Penn as Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. But to kids in the '90s, Brecken is that he's Jeff Spicoli. He's their Jeff Spicoli. That's funny. You know? And, and the ironic part, of course, is that Brecken was never a partier, never a pot smoker. In fact, he asked me to show him 
how do you smoke weed out of a honey bear? They've got this in the script, and I have no idea what that even means. I'm like, allow me to show you. Uh, so we clipped the top off and, you know, made a bong out of it. Um, but Brecken, you know, we Brecken's interesting because he's, he's a drummer. Like, when we started mm-hmm. off, basically, we both just loved being creative. So he mm-hmm. was a musician and an actor, and I was a musician and kind of sort of an actor. But we both had, you know, aspirations in several directions, and as mm-hmm. our lives and careers have gone on we both dabbled in many many things you know he's he does voice work he does acting he does producing he does writing he's done show running and he's a drummer he played with tom morello for years he's a really talented wow drummer. i didn't know that. yeah he was in the night watchman with tom morello wow and, um and then meanwhile while i was you know i started off as a musician i ended up as a director and a producer i've written eight books i play in a bunch of different bands like we both have just kind of gone in the direction of just like well just be creative and just if you're going to do a project finish it so we yeah and that's stuff. I, that's the whole thing with like doing a documentary too and it's uh I mean, could you pinpoint like you're just like we started here and now it's released now? Yeah, it, I would say. Or did you even know you were making a documentary when you did that EPK in '97? No, you kind of didn't know. I didn't know what this was until around 2012, was at the tail end of G4, right? Uh, when we were still making Freestyle 101 as a podcast, and it was kind of the <laughs> end of of as uh-huh. as the network was coming to an end and the podcasts were coming to an end and everything was coming to an end. Uh, we were running around filming more content for this concept of, free, of uh, freestyle 101. Uh-huh. And that was when we did the first interview with Reza since he had had the aneurysm. And when I interviewed him in 2012, that first time, or it might've even been 2011, but it was around that time. Um, that's when it first dawned on me. I was like, this is maybe a little bit more interesting than just an episode of Freestyle 101 or a conversation in this larger conversation of rapping. Um, and I think it was uh, Robert Juster, who you, we all mm-hmm. know from yes. G4 Days and myself, and Joe Lynch was involved at that right. time. Uh, we all kind of looked at the footage and went like, this is really interesting and maybe we should continue going down this path. In 2015 was when or by 2015 we we were really like knee deep in shooting it and um by the end of 2015 into 16 we started realizing like okay i think we have a film now so i you know since 2015 we've been sort of putting it all together getting it edited getting it sold doing all that stuff um so it's it's certainly been a long journey yeah it's it's i think when you do anything kind of diy it's uh they're they're they're, they're gonna you're gonna be presented with challenges and you're gonna be doing jobs that like maybe you didn't know how to do before but now now you're doing it yeah like, your marketing your you know your distribution all of that it's a, a thing with indie film where it's like you you really are on all sides yeah and know? and that you know one thing we all came uh, at some point we all crossed paths at mm-hmm. uh, at G4 and one thing that's interesting about that is that that was an interesting time to be uh, in show business because technology was kind of exploding. The video game thing was exploding. Documentary films were kind of coming through a renaissance. And podcasting, it was the early days of podcasting. Yeah. And you, up until that period in time, I feel, feel like when you got into show business, you had to sort of pick your lane. Like, yeah. I'm going to be a director, or I'm going to be a writer, yeah. or I'm going to be in post, or I'm going to be a sound guy. At some point in the early to mid 2000s, because the media was going through this renaissance, to be in the media, you had to learn to bob and weave. Right. And so, like, I feel like a lot of us that came out of not just G4, but that time in being in the media, like, everyone I know from that era is a director, producer, writer, podcaster with, that does this, this, this on the side, too. You know, like we all kind of had to learn to wear a bunch yeah. of different hats because it was the only way to survive and thrive in that environment. Well, know? yeah, because it just, you know, entertainment at that time became even more fluid. I mean, the multi hyphenate was always a, a thing, right? Sure. Uh, writer, director. But now it's just sort of that's turned into a paragraph. Yeah. You you really need to have an, uh, just a multitude of skills in yeah. order to, you know, make make some mark in entertainment now. There's just there's just really no way. And, and, and you have to be flexible. 
you yeah. have to be flexible and you have to learn jobs you didn't think you'd need to learn and yeah. and and uh I don't know I think it's an exciting time because previous to that I don't know that the tools were really in our hands right, right? where you could take this black mirror right and through that I mean look as much as we've got all this equipment sitting around for this podcast technically all you need is really an iPhone or a mobile device to do a podcast you can record it upload it and do the, do everything on on your mobile device. That's why I love the the those guys that like I'm gonna make an iPhone movie. I'm not gonna wait for my opportunity. And then suddenly they've you know done everything, including edited it on their iPhone. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I mean Soderbergh did one like that uh, uh, recently. Yeah, so and did you see? Was it called Tangerine? Tangerine. Oh, it's fantastic. on Netflix. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Great movie. Just and it and well shot. Like it looks yes. really good. They use the iPhone 5s. Yeah. to shoot tangerine yeah. but you know there's a lot there's a lot you can do in post obviously again yet another skill but but on the business side that's the thing with with indie film like there's there's even more you can do now like this movie is out now on vod so you can go on you can go on itunes you can go everywhere but you made that happen right like yeah you guys made that deal we we went and we spent a long time doing trying or you know going down every path you can you can go down with this thing and we ended up finding this company called indie rights and we got along well with them, them real well yeah. and they uh take it out to the digital platforms, but they kind of roll it out. So you you hit one and focus on it as you go, as opposed to just wide release day of, because these days there's so many ways to get content that if you spread yourself too thin, you don't really make a dent anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you go to Amazon or iTunes first and focus your first you know month or so on that, you can actually chart and then use that charting position to gain a little leverage as you go to the next platform. And the next one, you start to sort of build your story as it rolls out. Uh, so folks can go to Amazon right now. Mm -hmm. We have a website also risen documentary.com. You can learn more about it then. Uh, and there's, you know, there's trailers and stuff up on YouTube and all that jazz, but, uh, Amazon, Amazon prime is the place you want to go, uh, to check out risen, the story of Shron Hellraiser Smith. I, I like, I like your, see now your publicist skills <laughs> are coming into play with promoting sure. the movie, which I mean, you know, you, I mean, yeah, you have to have those skills. Um, but uh, I don't know. Amazon's an interesting beast, too, because is it the way that it works is you get paid by is it on Prime? So it's on Prime. It's right? on Prime. Yeah. OK, and it's cool. Which, which everybody has. But like but uh, you get paid per minutes viewed, yeah. which I've seen some numbers of friends of mine that have had movies on Amazon. And it's shocking how crazy the numbers are. Right. Like it, it's it's I mean, you know, thousands and thousands of minutes. Yeah. It, it, I mean, the whole Amazon is such a, a it, who would have thought that like our entire. The entire way that people purchase, buy things would change f to one model, you know, like, for instance, I, I mean, I just the other day did a shopping spree. On Amazon, you know, right. so I bought a because I've got Prime, so I bought a bunch of stuff, knowing a bunch of it wouldn't fit or just wouldn't be quite what I thought, and then because all the shipping and returns are free, and now up, you know, even up until recently, you'd have to like repackage it yourself. Now they literally just give you a barcode. You walk into the UPS, just hand them a garment, and has scan a barcode. You you, you take this. I I don't they, want this uh, cowboy Motley Crue shirt I bought. Uh, you right, know what I mean? Right. And I don't know what I was thinking. So I mean, but literally, like I, my regular jam now is buying stuff, and then I get it, and I go. Eh, Nah. And <laughs> and then and then when you don't have to go get in your car and drive down and try shit on, boy, your standards of what you'll buy are low. I <laughs> I bought a rat T-shirt the other day. The band Rat. There's no why. You, There's no reason, you but I did. Worn it. You should have worn it today. That would have been awesome. I, to be perfectly honest, I was pretty happy with my rap. <laughs> <laughs> it says Rat and Roll. When I was a kid, uh, my friend always tells this story that when he first met me. Um, he asked me, what kind of music do you like? You know, like you'd ask another kid on the playground, like, hey, kid, like, what, what are you into? And my answer, and this tells you exactly the year that I would have answered this, was I'm into two kinds of music, ant music and rat and roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my so. God. See, this is, this is the <laughs> – what you just said is the very reason why I will never get a tattoo. 
Yeah. Because I kind of feel like... Because I would have 19 adamant and rat tattoos. <laughs> it would just, Yeah, just sort of like... I feel like a tattoo for a lot of people is sort of like, here's the thing I'm into at this moment. Right now. I mean, yeah, exactly. I so, sure hope I like it for the rest of my life. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I did think about getting a Star Wars tattoo at but one point. even that would be a mistake now. I, now it would be a big mistake, I kind of feel like, with these uh, last few movies. are just, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what I don't, Star Wars for me is like a bad relationship. Some fond memories, but I'm glad I'm not no longer involved. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel about Star I, Wars. I, I am. It was fine, and and you know what? We're good. It, uh, Star did Wars. Did you like Mandalorian? Was, I like Mandalorian. I, I like Mandalorian. It, it's not great. It's it's really good, yeah. and it's and it's entertaining. It's fun. It is not a great show. Right. It's not a show that's gonna like. You know, it changed my life, or it's, you know what I mean. It's like Baby Yoda's cute, right? Yeah, okay, I don't so know that's... that I would have anchored the entire plot of the show around Baby Yoda. Like, like the one episode when he's introduced, I was like, "Oh, that's the Baby Yoda." And like three episodes later, I'm like, "We're still on Baby Yoda." Like, what the, <laughs> right, like, this right. is a thing now. Oh, like, no, no, the whole show is about Baby Yoda. The show, whole show will be about and, Baby and Yoda also, into season twenty. And the other thing that I didn't realize till I was a little bit into it is that that's not Yoda. Yeah, it's not Yoda. I mean, timeline-wise, that's not our Yoda. It's just another Yoda. Doesn't Which, that... okay, can I tell you the, the... So that means they all look like Yoda, in which case the Yoda we know is not special at all. <laughs> well, here's the deal, is there was another Yoda-type character in the prequels named Yaddle, if you recall. I absolutely do not these recall. Are not, these, <laughs> these are not deep cuts. I'm not... There was another Yoda-type... We don't even know Yaddle. what the name of Yoda's species is, but the rumors are that the baby Yoda is potentially a clone of Yoda, which would make it high value. Or, wait, I know it's dumb. Or the other thing <laughs> is is that, that I, I've heard this for, for a number of years. There's, there's a really good book, if you want to know everything about Star Wars, called The Secret History of Star Wars. I recommend just get the audio version of the book. Don't read the physical book. Because that, reading's dumb. No, it's not that reading's <laughs> dumb. The guy who reads the book, he does basically everyone's voice. Oh, that's cool. He does the voice. Of you know, he does uh, he does Irvin Kirshner, he does George Lucas. Oh, you don't mean the character good. voices, you mean the filmmaker voices. The filmmaker voices, voices but wow. but the thing was <laughs> is there's a thing where it's like Star Wars, the adventures of Luke Skywalker from the Journal of the Wills, spelled W H I L L S. A rumor I've heard for a long time is that the Wills are the species of mm. what Yoda is. So since that's actually never been explained in the movies and J.J. Abrams, in my opinion, shit the bed with that last film where he could have made some reveal or had it all mean something instead of like remaking Return of the Jedi. It, 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 I don't know what he was doing. It was just like, you know what? I'm just going to it's going to move so fast. You're going to forget the last thing you saw and we're just on to the next thing. So uh, I don't know. But we'll maybe we'll see that. My understanding is maybe we'll learn the name of what the the child is in season two. That has been a rumor. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm just, uh, it's weird. We're talking all this pop culture stuff, but when we would see each other at G4, we would always talk about like whatever was sort of like happening in the, whether it was the biggest video game, the biggest, whatever, you know what? We'll have another conversation about well, and there's G4 also, for another thing. There's also another project. A bunch of us, yourself and myself, were also huge horror movie and sci-fi. Oh geeks, God, so, yeah. So that ran a lot of the, the the conversations would center back to, you know. Which I love that there's like a renaissance in you know we talked about like the way your film is being distributed. It's very indie. You know, you have control over it. You are you know it's not like you're passing it off to some company. Like hope they do a good job. So so. You know, your film is like out there. You have control over the. I mean, you know, I, you know, I got in touch with you through Robert Jester, who's sitting in our studio audience. It's very small, looking very point. handsome. Yeah, um, but uh, I love that. And there's been, in my opinion, there's been like this huge resurgence in like indie sci-fi, indie horror, indie documentaries of all genres, okay. right? So I feel like that resurgence is because like all these tools are available because the pathway to distribution isn't something where you have to beg to get like a good deal. There are pathways you can take, you know, yourself, you can partner with a company like you did or, you know, uh, go, go your own way. Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, the thing that I, that I like about that is it's a blessing and a curse. It true on one hand, those days of a company handing you a big old check to cover your budget are fewer and far between because even 
bigger movies these days are not at the budgets they were back in the day. Right. I mean, I'm not talking about like Avengers and stuff. I'm just talking about like normal movies. Um, but, you know, budgets aren't what they used to be. And certainly in the world of documentaries, to get anyone to give you a budget at all is is not necessarily realistic. Um, but it so so you're not getting that that check you might have gotten cut from the big guy that's putting out your movie. On the other hand, you can make completely your own movie now and get it seen the way you want it to be. You don't have to, there's, you're not beholden to anyone. Right. And there is a freedom if you're someone who's either has a story to tell or is just an artist who just wants to make art and doesn't care either about the business part or, or you know, we all have to care about the business part, but is not as concerned about getting an assistance to do something at a bigger level when they could do what they want to do at a smaller level. Because mm -hmm. now the smaller level does have an opportunity to get seen. Uh, you know, in the world of music, a lot of people are making records that are charting from their garage band. Right. You know, I mean, like, like for real, like they're like, like a lot of Billie Eilish's record was made on GarageBand by her and her brother in their room. Think about how many, what, think about what that means. Not just the fact that like, wow, it's cool that someone made a DIY record that, that blew up, but the juggernaut financially that the Billie Eilish movement is mm -hmm. cost probably a hundred bucks to make. I mean, but it's also impossible. Think about that profit margin right, right. for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's impossible for you to estimate exactly what it costs to make sure. Your I'm just just, saying, the it, time it, investment yeah, is the thing that it's like, you know, you need to be in a place where it's like you can actually spend that time. Well, that, right? And that's the difference is the time investment. You know, it, what I'm, what I'm referring more like the hardware. You don't have to go out and buy like a giant editing rig and go buy a huge expensive camera the way that you did. On the other hand, if you're doing it yourself, you got to have a ton of time and you have to, like we were just talking about before, you have to learn how to work a bunch of this stuff. You, know? right, right. you might have to learn how to edit. You know what I mean? And, right. That there, that's the stuff that you can't. There's no shortcuts for that. You gotta put in the time. You gotta put in. You gotta pour your heart into it. Um, but the gear doesn't cost as much as it used to. Right. And the opportunities to get your vision out the way that you want are 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 out there in a way they've never been before. Well, that's that's where that term prosumer came from. Remember that right, term? Do they right. even use that term prosumer anymore? I don't know. It's um it sounds it also sounds like a rad band name for like a prog band. You know? like, <laughs> prosumer. Prosumer. <laughs> like a tool side project. <laughs> are you still are you still doing music too? Like yeah. just because I, I feel like I saw your band once. You you, you did have. that or I, I saw thought, you know, Well, we played in a band once. Do you remember that at the at, there was a G four party where we did a cover a band second. set? We did you did, did you sang Living on a Prayer. I did? You sure did. Wow. Yeah, we did, uh, I think we did Cherry Bomb and Living on a Prayer, and uh, it was our buddy AP from uh, Knights of Monte Carlo was involved. Oh, my God. And we played yeah. at the Cat Club. Oh, my God. I totally yeah, remember yeah, that yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was terrible. No, I don't know about I terrible. I was terrible. You, sir, were a delight. Um, oh, God. That was embarrassing. I think that was like... I think the only reason that I was like, okay, I'll embarrass myself is there was some, uh, if I recall correctly, some charity element to it. Yeah, right? I think there was some yeah. charity element, but also I think you kind of just want to sing some Bon Jovi and, and let sure. it Sure, that is exactly why I did that. But uh, yeah, I have a band called oh The Streetwalk and Cheetahs that was around in the 90s and released a ton of records then broke up for a decade and is now back together we have a new single out uh you can get it on spotify and amazon and apple music called we are the ones we've been waiting for and mm -hmm. a new album on the way uh i have a band out of long beach called blind house that's members of the cadillac tramps and social distortion and mm -hmm. me oh we, wow we have a new that's single cool. coming out in a couple of weeks called california sound and i sing with james williamson the guitarist of the stooges we've done a couple records together and um we have a band called james williamson and the pink hearts and I also sing with a guy I'm guessing you're familiar with, the 80s heavy metal gladiator Thor, star of <laughs> Rock and Roll Nightmare and Zombie Nightmare. Oh, man. Uh, over the years, I have became friends with that lovable heavy metal gladiator and have produced like three records and I'm actually 
uh, his new single I co-wrote and produced, and we're performing it at the Whiskey this Thursday. Nice. Yes. Although by the time this airs, it'll be the Whiskey last Thursday. (laughs) But um, yeah, so it's it's a weird thing because I I basically play in a punk band, a rock band, and a power metal band, and then with a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. It's a very weird musical career. But But that's good. You have to uh, diversify your creative portfolio. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And documentary filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. All right, Frank, uh, again, if you could just, uh, where's the website people can get more info? You can go to risendocumentary.com. You can go to Amazon or Amazon Prime to pick up the movie Risen, the story of Shran Halreza Smith. And uh, Frank, thank you so much for thank doing the you, film. Thank you, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, no, no. Yeah, We're on, doing this. this. Actually, the new one is. Have you seen What's people the new one? doing the the the? Sh- the, the, the I shoe have bomb. not. I can't do the. the I can't do the shoe. Really, bomb. this doesn't look awkward. No. It uh, it, it, it probably looks awkward on camera. <laughs> uh, but thank you for uh, appearing on the film. Yeah, no camera. problem. Man. It's awesome. Thank you. Cool.